thanks for coming. I have to tell you about about Sisters in Crime. I have this T-shirt that says Sisters in Crime, and I was wearing it one day, and some women were kind of whispering over in the corner, and finally one of them approached me and said, well, is that a people who have committed crimes that have maybe done time for... <laughs> I said, no. <laughs> we commit crimes on paper. So I have a distinguished group here, and what I'm going to do is just ask each of them to introduce themselves, but not immediately. What I'm going to do is ask them a question, and then they can introduce themselves. It's a little more informal that way. It's not quite, you know, go down the line and ask each person a question. So um, Joanne just told me that she got some good news, so why don't you introduce yourself and tell your good news? I did. I have a series out set in World War II, where the U.S. government recruits psychics to find Nazi spies. I found that the second book of the series that came out June 21 is a finalist position for East Texas Writers Guild. Oh, Yay. congratulations. <laughs> congratulations, that's yep. wonderful. So uh, let me ask you this, what, are, are you psychic? Is that one reason that you felt like you should? What, what led you to start writing this uh, series like this about the psychic? I had four other books out. Uh, they were romances. And in one of the medieval romances, I had pulled in a touch of the paranormal having, uh, because my heroine was sight impaired. And I had her have her grandmother, her, her, the ghost of her grandmother come at times to help her find the direction to get out of trouble, because on her own, it just was a little impossible in a medieval castle. So having that touch, I liked it, and I had gone in my early days uh, to Berkeley Psychic Institute. That was in the 60s and the 70s when the competition between the US and Russia on the paranormal was at its height, and there were a lot of books around and I went from 74 to 78. And I did, I was doing it for healing, which I think worked very well. And I, but I did get exposed to other kinds of paranormal. However, in writing the series or writing any book, you can't, you, you, you have to have what happens fit the story. I just can't take things from life. I have to have it fit the story. So my critique partners and I, we, brainstormed and we came up with characters that would be needed to get them out of different kinds of situations. Um, that's how the paranormal came in with my heroine who's clairvoyant, with a, a woman who sees, uh, who uh, has healing hands, a man who sees ghosts, and a crystal ball reader, and a man who's a medium. All of them coming out of the woo-woo 60s and 70s. <laughs> okay, that's great. Heather. Uh, yeah. You write a very funny series, and I see you have a brand new book out. I so uh, why don't you tell a little bit about yourself, and then tell us about your new book. Uh, oh, okay. Um, let's see. I was born on a trunk in Ringling Brothers Circus. That's always a good way to start. <laughs> my father was an elephant trainer, and my mother was a trapeze artist. So, uh, oh, is yeah, that that's, true? Is that really true? That's really true. Oh, and my this word. Is the book, that's my mother on here. That's really my mother. And wow. Um, wow. so I took um, their story, uh, their romance they met. He was actually, uh, this is not any, well, it was, it's a mystery, and it's not funny, but it's a noir. Um, <laughs> he was very kind to elephants. He was one of those four thinking forerunners. He didn't use the hook. He didn't do this. He didn't do that. He actually thought you know, teach them by love and train them that way. So my mother fell in love with them and they were married and all that stuff and blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, this is an interesting <laughs> past, kid. You've really, yeah, this works. So I wrote this story and it's all of her particular day-to-day -day life in, in, uh, in the circus, Ringling Brothers. It was also Ringling Brothers at the heyday of Ringling Brothers, 51 elephants and all these very big things. So I wrote that book and that took me six years. And I said, okay, I ain't never doing that anymore because <laughs> I'm too old. I mean, you're not 20, kid. You can't be doing that. So I have this series, which I can crank out about once every 10 months to a year. And it takes place today. This was in 1942. It's today. Uh, and it's uh, Silicon Valley. 
uh, with a, a detective agency. And what I threw in there, which was important to me, was that it's about an immigrant, uh, a, an immigrant from Mexico, he's, uh, and he makes, he does well, he does well, and he meets and marries a Palo Alto blue blood. And they have these two children, and the protagonist is from, is an offspring in there. So she's like half Mexican American, she's Latina, but wait a minute, I'm supposed to be, you know, this cool ice princess, so she's always doing that. And they own this detective agency, and they're always falling over dead bodies, and there are, there's a cat, you know, <laughs> the obligatory cat, but I love it, Tugger. And so they have fun, and I have a new one coming out in, um, in uh, September, this is kind of a prototype thing called the CEO came DOA, <laughs> and that's fun too. And that's what I do. Uh, uh, should I say anything else? Was that was that enough? Well, I'll ask you some other questions. Later. But that but that was wonderful. Oh. I, I I actually ran into somebody at Thriller Fest last week who's a trapeze artist. Oh my God! She's really? also a doctor. Well, so go figure. <laughs> so that's great. Okay, now we have. We have two very unusual people, and then we have Lisa Brackman, whose first book made a splash in the New York Times, and if you have not read Rock, Paper, Tiger, you have missing a great book. And every one that she's come out with since then, I have a 29-year-old son who said, when she wrote her second book, which was called Get Away, and said in Mexico, he said, when is she going to write another one? I loved it. So now I think she's written, is that a a sequel to it that that we're calling oh. it a second cousin twice removed. Okay. <laughs> so tell us about both of your series. They're they're very different. You know where did that come from? Oh, first I want to say that it's it. You know if you're going to follow the elephants, that's never going to go well. Um, so here I am. Um, so yeah, Rock Paper Tiger um, was set in in contemporary China. And I've done three books. Uh, they feature an accidental Iraq war vet named Ellie McEnroe, um, who finds herself in Beijing um, associating with contemporary Chinese artists. So if you're interested in contemporary Chinese art, the war on terror, environmental disaster, and lifestyles of the super rich and heinous in China, you might enjoy these books. Oh, yes. um, they've got one of them on the back table there, which I should have had up to go like this, but I didn't think about that. Um, this is my book that just came out. Uh, it's not really a series. I never intended to write series. Uh, I didn't intend to write three books set in China, um, but I did. And I did the book in Mexico. It was my attempt at a noir thriller, you know, which, which in my formulation is a, a woman or a man in trouble meets a man or a woman who is trouble, and things go from bad <laughs> to very bad to very, very, very bad, you know, because otherwise there's no book. So um, I finished that book, and I thought it was done, and I didn't plan on revisiting those characters at all, and then my, my publisher said, what do you think about writing a sequel to that? And I was like, no, why would I want to do that? It's done. And then I thought a little bit about it, and I thought about the main character in particular, who, when you meet her in the first book, she's um, a woman who's experienced personal trauma. She's on vacation in Mexico, having her, had her life totally upended and, and feeling betrayed, and she doesn't know what she's going to do, and, and she meets the guy who is trouble, and things don't go well. But, you know, she starts from a position of being in completely over her head because, you know, ordinary people who just go on vacation in Mexico don't expect to be dealing with the kinds of things she ends up dealing with. Um, and the people that I write about tend to be very, they're normal, ordinary people who get involved in extraordinary situations. So I thought it would be really fun to take her where she is at the end of the book after a very steep learning curve and, and show how she responds to getting in another really horrible situation. <laughs> and it was a lot of fun to write and it's centered around uh, the, uh, the US prison industry, for-profit prisons, the war on drugs, and uh, black money, uh, 501c4s, and, and you know, fun things. You know, you can tell that she just writes just a, a very light sort of a thing. You know? Yeah, I, I enjoy it, yeah. Well, I'd just like to know a couple, I mean, 
I've always loved mysteries, and in the first in the first reading I ever did three years ago, a man in the audience said, "Do you write mysteries because you think you're not good enough to write mainstream fiction?" <laughs> well, that was a challenge, but but I actually had a I had a good answer for him, which was that I felt that a lot of some of the best writing that's done today is done in the mystery genre, and I have bookstore owners who say that they have trouble deciding whether to put the books in the mystery section or whether they put them in the mainstream section because there's some very meaty mysteries out there. So l I'd just like to ask each of you, just in a few sentences, what, why mysteries? Do, have you always wanted to write mysteries or just uh, grab you? Did that subject grab you? How did that happen? Joanne? I started out writing romance because when I started writing, which is as I was coming up onto retirement, the romance industry had 50% of all the sales, right. and it was a lot easier to get into it, and I hadn't written anything, and I had read a lot of romances in the 1980s, so I thought I'd give that a try. I, the intention was to make some money on top of my Social Security, <laughs> but I didn't realize that <laughs> uh, writers don't make money, at least especially in the <laughs> early days. In fact, the joke is that the only people who make money in publishing are those who sell services to authors. Oh, those are... Good yeah. point, yeah. Anyway, I started out with romance, and one of them had a mystery in it. And I found out I couldn't write mystery, but I was really good at suspense and thrillers. I'm really good at getting the pace up and at keeping the tension up. So with the mystery, I had to keep all a few things away from you readers. And I'm used to giving you all the information. You're in the head of my villains as well as my heroine and my hero. And I just had a hard time keeping things back. My critique partners were on me all the time. So I find I don't write mysteries. I write thrillers, soft thrillers, and suspense. Oh, I'm going to talk to you afterwards. I'm writing a thriller, and I'm having trouble with some of the action scenes. So <laughs> I want that. Yeah, so... Let's just go down the line with this one. Lisa, why mysteries? Or that, I, that I, area? I, too, write more suspense um, than, than traditional mysteries. And um, I do it for a bunch of reasons, I guess. Um, oh, by the way, you know the action sequences? You get mm -hmm. those two uh, little artist dolls, the little bendable <laughs> ones, and then you... <laughs> Well, today I was. Does, sort does that of actually work? Yeah. It today does. I was doing this to myself and saying, yeah, you know, how does, how does it? Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I think in part because I, I do like dealing with contemporary themes, uh, rock, paper, tiger, aside from what's going on in China. And I spent a lot of time in China, you know, for going back to 1979. But, you know, I was interested in the surveillance state. I was interested in Chinese art. I was interested and infuriated um, uh, with the war on terror. Um, on And Getaway, I was really, like I said, I mostly wanted to just write a fun little noir thriller, but there are issues of corruption on both sides of the border. Um, Hour of the Rat, you know, China has horrible, devastating environmental problems, and, and that was something that I thought would be fun, you know, <laughs> to deal with. And, and also our own role in that. Um, and... Uh, you know, go between. I said what that was about, and I think I, I, you know the fun thing about writing suspense is that it really is a way to to deal with contemporary issues and put it in a form where you're not, you know, I'm not somebody that can write um, a, a didactic essay preaching about all the things that I'm upset about or what what I think is wrong, and I'm not really interested in 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 reading that either. But there are ways to embed these themes very deeply within the structure of your story so that you're not preaching and you're not being didactic, but people still get something out of it because of the way, the, the potential for story to carry meaning in a very different way. And I guess I just like working with that. Well, you answered three of my questions all at once right there. That's great. Sorry. No, no, that's great. I like it. I mean, it was a, it was a wrap up there. I, I remember hearing Denise Minna. Is that her name? Did she pronounce it Minna or Mina? Not sure, but she's hilarious. Uh, well, she is she a writes one. really serious books, but she's one of the she's funniest a wonderful people writer. Too. But I remember she has a PhD in um, she's a PhD psychologist, and she said that she thought, well, I could go in and and reach one person at a time, or I could write mystery novels and reach a lot of people. 
Uh, and I thought that was a very interesting thing to say. So, Heather, how about you? What brought you to Mysteries? Well, first of all, I was just in love with Nancy Drew <laughs> and The yeah. Secret of the Old Clock. It's the first book I ever read. Uh, that Well, no, uh, Uncle Remus was the first book I ever <laughs> read. But, I mean, it's kind of going to the library and picking out your own book. I picked out Nancy Drew and The Secret of the Old Clock, and there was just no turning back. I said, I want to be her and I want to write about her. But I grew up a little bit, and I don't quite write a, about her and anymore, but I still think it was a big influence for me. I really enjoy those. So I like, uh, I tend to write um, mystery thrillers. I, I think my uh, heroine gets in trouble every now and then, but we always know that she is going to do it in Prada Heels, and she is going to be fine. I like to pride myself on writing a beach read. I'm, I write s something, not, not this. This was my, this was uh, six years. <laughs> really, guys. I mean, six years. Um, I like to write something that is going to take people away, make them escape. I try to have a little bit. It's all family involved. I think that's important. Family is important. And in this one, it's about the immigration, terrible issues with that, but all done with a lot of humor. So I, I like to write funny things, and that's it. That's what I like to write. Well, I guess I'm the only straight mystery uh, writer here. I write about Samuel Craddock as a uh, chief of police in a small town in Texas, uh, a man who feels a great sense of responsibility for being the chief of police. He's um, an upright guy, and he's never worn any Prada shoes in his whole life. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, that's uh, that's where mine goes. Um, tell me, tell me, Lisa, what is your favorite part about writing? What do you like? What do, what do you like about writing? Why would you even do it? The part where I write end. <laughs> no, that okay. That's um, you know that's a really hard question because writing you know when you're doing it is professional author for publication it's a job and you know you can have the best job in the world but some days it's just work but you still it, it it's you know I think there's this idea that as writers you're supposed to be inspired by the muse and that you know you wait for this inspiration and it floods down upon you and you know and it's not really mm -hmm. how it works for me um, I approach it like it it's a job that I sit down to do that said, it's a pretty interesting, fulfilling, and challenging job where I'm not bored. And um, I, every most of jobs I've had, um, I'm I'm a little ADD. I get very bored, and I don't get bored with writing books. I really enjoy being able to absorb a lot of material, um, craft it into a narrative, tell stories through people. Um, there's something about the act of writing and when you write, when you you come up with, I just finished a partial that I turned into my agent and I was like, I get to the end of it and I'm like, I stuck that landing. <laughs> I knew I did um, and it felt so good. There's just something about the act of creation. I mean, mm. you can't beat it when, when you do it right. Well, the um, I, I think that's right. I, I guess what, for me, when I'm writing, a lot of times when I'm starting, I start with an image, and I just the image just haunts me and bothers me, and then I think of somebody in a particular scene, and it just keeps going and going, and then I think, well, what if this happened, and what if that happened? So that was sort of what I was thinking about is, well, is how that uh, how that b little germ of something grows and becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, and then the next thing you know, you're writing along, and only one of my books went off in a really bad direction, and by the end, I said, what happened here? I had to go all the way back, about halfway back, and just rip it to pieces because it had taken a wrong direction, and I never quite figured out why. It was as if I, my, I let the characters get away with too much or something. So, Joanne, what about you? How do you, how, how do you start it? What, what do you like about doing it? Mm -hmm. How do you start it? Fortunately, although I started out with an economic reason, I fell in love with writing. And I will do it for the rest of my life, no matter what. 
and I'll probably keel over at the keyboard, and I'm doing the next <laughs> book in the sequel <laughs> of the Operation <laughs> Delphi series. I like best editing. Oh. I feel like I, yes, oh. I do. <laughs> I feel like I'm a sculptor. I am taking away the, the rough stuff and getting down to the core of the image, and I love doing that. Oh, interesting, because I, I feel like when I start a first draft, I feel like it's just, you know, just put the words on the page. I don't care what the words are. Just put them down there, and I'm the same way. Once I get to the editing, it's sort of like it's to shape it. Yeah. How about I, uh, you, Heather? I started out... Um, as a writer for uh, Gray Advertising, and then I moved to No Soap Radio, which was a lot of fun, and I wrote commercials. And basically, it's a job. I would have to go and go to work. And when I was with No Soap Radio, I not only had to go to work, I had to be funny. And we would sit around a, a table, and we would all discuss how we were going to be funny and what the best way of being funny was, and that was our job. And the best part about it was that what I learned was the work is the singularly most important thing. So everybody's ego went back. Could you come up with the best idea? Could you come up with the best joke? Could you come up with the best ending? Could you come up with the best phrase, imagery, whatever? And it didn't matter who did it because it was the end product that we were dealing with. And for me, it's carried over into everything. It's carried over into writers' groups that I've been in when I've taken classes in writing. And I've, you know, I'm sure everybody else does it too. You study. It's a craft. It's like playing tennis. You get better. The more you practice, the more you do it, you're going to be better. And I think Terry and I were just talking a little bit earlier, and she says everybody thinks that the last book is the best book, probably because it is. You get better every time you write. Now, maybe there's a point when you just go gaga and they need to take you away. Okay, but that's like a different thing. I think we all get better at our crafts every time we do it. And that's what this is, a craft. It's really not done by smoke and mirrors. It's done by, by just working at it. Um, I love to be taken away into the silliness of a situation or into the import of it or into the tragedy of it. I, I, I love that part when in my mind I'm going somewhere other than myself or other than me. The world of imagination, I think, as a writer, you have to be willing to make an ass of yourself. That <laughs> is very crucial. You have to be willing to put something down on paper and say, well, let's see if this flies. Let's see if this works. And then you go with it. If it doesn't, for me, they're just words. I have a million of them. I have thrown out more stuff, kept other stuff. So it's a job. Absolutely. But it is the most fun job I've ever had. I'm so grateful because life took over and it's hard to make a living as a writer. I did it for a while in New York City and then life happened and, you know, all that stuff. And I got a chance to go back to it um, about 15 years ago and started writing the novels and I've never looked back. And I think for everybody here and there to do what inspires you, do what you love. And it doesn't matter whether you make money at it or not. You know, do it. Because life is short, guys. I was 19 years old just two years ago. I remember. <laughs> Boy, do I know what you're talking about. <laughs> you know, I hadn't actually planned to do this, but something you said made me think of this. Um, and that is, you know, really being involved in what you're writing. But there is a movement that has just started because of um, the ubiquity of guns in our oh. in our uh, in our society there has been started a group of writers who write crime fiction who have decided they're not going to put guns in their books so what I, I'm, I'm very curious to know what kind of um, what kind of weapons do you guys use oh boy hmm. well I use uh, she has a blue lady gun uh, which rarely gets, most of the time it's kept in her safe, but she's a black belt in karate. I mean, this is my dream. I can make this up. It's my <laughs> yeah, stuff. Exactly, exactly. You can make it up. So, and she, yeah, and she's a frustrated ballerina too, but basically she's a black belt in karate, and most of the time 
She uses her smarts, her noodles, and occasionally a swift kick in the stomach. Wherever, yeah. Wherever. <laughs> How about you, Lisa? Do you? I I don't. Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't really. I don't remember in your books. I mean, it's yeah, sort of like I d they don't have a super high body count, although the yeah. one I'm working on now yeah. definitely does. Yeah. <laughs> um, Great. I mean, the only weapon I can really th well, I, I can't really say because. Okay. I can't really That's all say. Right. Well, uh, somebody not, asked they're me they're what my worst weapon was, and I said a rock. <laughs> no, I had. I, 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 there was a golf club gets involved yeah. At, yeah. At, at, <laughs> in one of the books, yeah. but you know, it's. Um, they're not, th my main characters, the ones that I've written, um, none of them are black belts in anything, and um, they're not, this isn't their skill set. Um, the, the gal who's in this one, after her really, really, really bad experiences, um, you know, she does some self-defense training, she learns how to shoot, but you actually don't see her employing those skills very much at all. It's really about Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thinking and trying to figure things out and um and it's a lot of it in this book is i think a friend of mine described it as you you, it, you just know something really terrible is going to happen but you know it, it, it's yeah well it's someone asked me on a panel recently um what what the best weapon that my my protagonist uses and i said his attitude yeah he's the boss so how about you joanne my novels are set in World War II, so guns are going to come in there somewhere. Yeah. Right now, it's only the Shore Patrol who's carrying them because my characters are looking for spies, and they're doing it through paranormal means. So there's a lot of mental activity, mm. but no guns have been drawn. Mm. Very interesting. Okay, well, that's terrific. Um, so <laughs> what's your favorite fan letter you've ever gotten? Have any of you gotten fan letters? What have you got that, what did, what did you like? Early on when I was writing romances, the one and only fan letter that I got with actual mail through snail mail. Oh, I'm talking was, about emails too. <laughs> was from a woman who was paralyzed and homebound. Mm. And she liked my novels and said, I'll be your fan for life. Wow. Oh, Can't get nice. better than that. Yeah. Um, so uh, the China books, Rock, Paper, Tiger, the protagonist is, as I mentioned, is sort of an accidental Iraq war vet. She had the background of being a medic and experiences a lot of really, I was inspired, if you can use that word, by uh, Abu Ghraib and prisoner abuses. So just know that there's a lot of dark and very unpleasant things in these books. And I guess the, 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 emails that have meant the most to me, and the response has been from, from veterans, Iraq veterans, because I was extremely worried about my ability to, to do that credibly, and I wanted to do it right. And um, one of the emails I received was from a woman who thanked me for the books and said that it helped her make some sense of some things she had been feeling since she got back. And I was... <sighs> I didn't even know how to react to that. It was actually both really gratifying and extremely upsetting because, you know, nobody should need my help processing an experience like that. That's incredible. Yeah. yeah. Um, I just, uh, I get emails and fan letters, which I love, and a lot of times they're from men. One, the best one, there's two good ones that I really got. One of them was from a woman who was going through chemotherapy, and she had her sister, because she, she couldn't really read it at that time, had her sister read it, and that it distracted her and made her laugh and made her feel some pleasant hours. And man, when you can do that for somebody, help somebody through a tough day, You've done it. The funniest one is very recent. A man uh, wrote, an e uh, sent me an email saying that he he thought my books. He read uh, Death Runs in the Family, uh, which it takes place in Las Vegas, and he said, "I read this, and despite the fact that there are all these cats in it, he said because I can't stand the little buggers." said, but actually, you know, if you take the cats out, the hero wouldn't like it, but I'd say give it a 10 stars. <laughs> <laughs> so 
that was just the funniest thing. So I tend, because I'm kind of warm and fuzzy, did you pick that up? Okay. So I'm kind of warm and fuzzy. So I get emails that are warm and fuzzy, and I always respond to them. And I used to respond to um, when reviews, when mm -hmm. people would write reviews. And I understand we're really not supposed to do that, which really breaks my heart, because I've made some friends and everything on when they write reviews on Amazon. I and think it's I, mostly you're not supposed to respond to negative reviews, because sometimes those people are very sensitive about that. I don't know anyway it, it, because I've made some friends by by uh, yeah. responding to I think the world needs more touchy feely. I really do. I think we all need that and I wish I could respond so if anybody ever wants to email me please do. I'll I'll send you brownies. I mean I'm good with that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I have two favorites. One was after the first book um, a woman wrote to my um, publisher and said, I just love this book by Terry Shames, and I will read anything he writes. <laughs> <laughs> and then she said, and I especially like the size of them because they fit right into my purse. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. And then I got one recently from a man who, uh, who said, I am so happy that I was introduced to your books by my bookseller. I went and bought all five of them because... They're just so wholesome, and so I'm thinking, wholesome? Do you understand this is about murder? <laughs> <laughs> and it was from some reverend somebody from a mega church in North Carolina. <laughs> so those people are bloodthirsty. <laughs> <laughs> so um, how do you come up with your plots? I have such trouble with plots. How do you come up with your plots? Read the paper. I'll tell okay. you, I, I, the truth okay, is Okay, so, I'll do that. <laughs> truth is stranger than fiction, don't you think? Yeah, I, I oh, really... Well, stranger I and do. often crueler. Mm, yeah. For yeah. sure, for yeah. sure. Yeah, so you get yours from the newspaper, is that right? Oh, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll go. go yeah, it, yeah, in fact, um, A Wedding to Die For, which was the second book, came from... I was reading National Geographic, which I do, uh, and I like that magazine, and in there was an article about a family in Egypt that for 60 years had been pilfering this lesser-known Egyptian king's tomb, pharaoh's tomb. And through the years, and it was they followed the progress of them, because they would only take one piece and they would sell it uh, uh, on the sly, whatever, that meant that them, the, the whole extended family, was enriched and made better. So they all got educations. They all, so after 60 years, these people were lawyers, doctors, Indian chiefs, you know, all these kind of wonderful things. Oh, I probably shouldn't have said Indian chiefs. That was very un PC, forgive oh, me. I'm That's sorry. Okay. We, I just you're went absolved. with the childhood thing <laughs> there. Anyway, um, and they were discovered after 60 years, and there was probably 80, 80 of them in this family, and only because. One of the family members got greedy. He was working at the famous museum in Cairo, and he substituted a real piece of antiquity for a fake. It was discovered, and they tracked everything down and found that this family had done that. So I just took that and ran. I said, oh, this is just <laughs> too good. I have to write. So I transferred it to Mexico. I made it between the Toltecs and all this kind of stuff. I had a lot of fun with it. So I tend to base mine always on, on what I read. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Lisa, how about you? Um... Obviously, I'm inspired by current events, but it's not generally a specific story like that. Um, it's more of a, a, a broader issue, and I tend to, I tend to go very wide and just take in a lot of information because you know you don't know what you don't know, and and I want to kind of learn it. Um, I'm really inspired by place. Um, it, you know, place is a character to me, and then with the characters. Well, at this point, I have had characters that I've written in more than one book. Um, but when I start a book, um, it's a really weird kind of mental process where I feel like I'm watching these people, that they're outside of me, and I'm observing their behavior, which I know is not normal. Um, or a writer it is. Yeah, and, and, then, and then eventually when I get to know them, you know, it's the interaction of the characters. The characters have to drive the story. Um, I, I don't 
it, it's it's a really hard thing for me to explain how I do it. I don't really know yeah. exactly, yeah. but it's those. So those you've got things sort together. of a social um, or a, a, a contemporary theme that you work from, and that fits in with that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, it really it, it really has to be. You know, I mean, I write one scene, and then I then it's like, well, what happens next? And then right. I write what happens yeah. next. So you know? what if? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and. You know, I don't really ever feel like the you know that whole thing where the characters are out of control and they're doing stuff. I don't feel like that. I don't. Yeah. But you know, you do have to let them guide the process, mm -hmm. or it's not going to be true to life. Right. Mm -hmm. Joanne, what about you? And then I add a car chase or something that explodes. Exactly. <laughs> and, then <you> <laughs> and then an explosion or two. Right. <laughs> I don't write contemporary because I don't have a clue what's going on today. And also, uh, uh, I c especially the technology. I can't, can't deal with the technology. So I've always written historical. My first romances were medieval. That's because Ainsworth is an Anglo-Saxon name. So I tried to go back and p take a period where there was some equality for women and a period of time without war. It took me until a generation after the Norman Conquest to find one, even though Ainsworth starts in the 900s. <laughs> then my, his, my westerns were set in Buffalo in 1895, and I had lived in Buffalo, Wyoming in, for four months and did a lot of historical tours there. So I said, well, why don't I use that? And then in, when I decided on doing World War II, I was live back then. I was going into first grade. So I had a lot of the feel of the times, and I figured I wouldn't have to do as much of the research on that. The, I am very structured. Hmm. I don't sit down and write anything. I piece mine together. I craft and pull it together from here and there. It, my critique partners are very influential in the first part with the brainstorming, getting the ideas and piece by piece putting the story together. And then once that part's done, then I love to edit. And I mm -hmm. massage it and get it going. You know, you've mentioned your critique partners. Do, it, do either of you um, have critique partners as well? Or do you, do, do you, what I do is I want to write the whole book and then I show it to a writer's group that I've had for 20 years. Only four of us and the other three do not write mysteries. And um, so I, I don't really like to do it as I go along. I don't want to hear what anybody has to say until I'm all done. But what, what about you two? Do you do that? I mean, do you have? Uh, well, uh, I have a writing group, too, for. Mm -hmm. I tend, the beginning of a book uh, to me is very important. Uh, that's where you make the contract with your reader. It's where the interest, they're going to make the investment of time. So to me, I, I want to make sure. And also, you're making this all up. <laughs> I'm right. making it up. Am I nuts today? Is this going to fly? Is this going to work? I don't know. So they also, my group, does not write. They don't. Not only do they not write mysteries, they don't write genre. They're actually serious literary writers, you know, the big stuff, the New Yorker, all that stuff. That's what they want to do. That's where they're going. I'm the only genre writer. So I give it to them, and I hope that they, I give them like the first 50 pages. How is this going? Does this have any interest for you at all? And, th and they are always wonderful feedback. Don't you think that you do all of you have critique groups that you deal with the writer groups? Because I just I often live don't without give, mine. I, I often don't give my stuff to the critique group because I have a deadline and I don't have time to oh. do it. And I feel, in the Samuel Craddock series, I feel very confident about what's coming out. But... Um, in the last one, I gave it to them because I was very excited. I thought it was probably really a good book. And um, they said that it was the best for sure. And that was nice. E you know, Although I, I have to argue with you on that one point about that every book is probably better than the ones before because haven't you all read something You know that you've read series and all of a sudden you read one and you think... What happened here? Oh, that was yeah. that didn't work out so well, you know. I, and I don't know if people just get bored with it or if they weren't fully present when they were writing it. But what do you think? Um, critique partners. I have a couple of friends, you know, that I show things to on occasion, not not regularly. Um, both of whom are writers. Um, I I 
I kind of try to balance the need to be working things out on my own with, I really want to get some feedback on this. Just tell me it's perfect. That's all I really want to hear. <laughs> <Exactly. Yeah. laughs> yeah, sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, and what was the other question? Oh, about why why people sometimes have a... a oh, why the series fall yeah. off? Yeah. yeah. I, I think, you know... Um, with with the Ellie books, you know, there was a point where my publisher wanted one. You know, they want one a year, and I just went, no, I, I can't do it. And I think it's because in the case of those books, it wouldn't be credible for that character to continue to be in these situations to experience, you know, ad trauma, adventure, all of these things to pick herself up, dust herself off, and do it again once a year. I just felt like that. And 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 I need more time. I need more of a break between the characters. So I wrote three, and if I never write another one, I feel like I completed it. Mm -hmm. um, I may do another one at some point, but I have to. I have to want to do it. I have to really feel it. I have to feel like there's some story that I want to tell with this character, with this setting, that I couldn't do with anything else. And and I think what happens is. It's comfortable to do a series because all kinds of things are set up for you. You don't have to rethink them every single time you approach the book. I think you can take it too far. I, I think it, you know. I, I think especially if you're under pressure to publish, um, you know, here's another one. Here's another one. Here's another one. You know, and and it's it's really easy. It's really easy to get into that situation, and every book's just not going to be as good their books you know I have writer friends who publish a lot of books and, and they'll say things like yeah I know this one wasn't as good but I was in a hurry and, <laughs> and you, you know I mean you know they're very they're very honest about it and it's just like you know I find that it is so hard to write a book anyway that it's not worth my time to half-ass it why bother right also I think what you're talking too. about is integrity that you have some integrity about what what you want to put but up isn't I don't each consider book, it integrity but <laughs> isn't each book fresh for you for me each book is like the beginning I, it's maybe I know the names of people but it's uh, always a different approach I challenge myself mm -hmm. every single time so for me every book is fresh and new but that's, that's that's what you have to do. Yeah. I mean, everybody's got it's a different way of doing it, but a lot of people don't. And you know, and it gets I, I, when you have series that just go on and on and on. Mm -hmm. You can tell when people are phoning it in. Well, not everybody. Ha I not feel everybody like with that my series, it the way that I have do, to have that you do. I have to have something central that is a social issue in each of yeah. mine. That and that has I have to do that. Right. Otherwise, I would be bored with it. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm going to ask one more question, and then we'll and then we'll turn it over to the audience. And the last question I'd like is: Everyone always seems to want to know what your process is. I will just briefly say, when I'm doing, I get up really early in the morning, and when I'm working on my first draft, the best thing I can do is start about six o'clock and just just write, just you know, let it flow. I don't always do that. But that's really my best time. And then I just write as much as I can during the day. I can't write more than about four hours because I get really tired. I just, I, I've always, and four hours is always, always, even when I was really young, that was just it. Bam, I'd hit a wall and I'd say, well, I can't go any farther. But <laughs> I do plenty of fooling around in between. And then there's all this promo that has to get done, which is awful. So how about you? I am also an early riser. My latest book just came out June 21, so right now I'm in the midst of marketing and not getting any writing done. Oh. However, I normally get up early, 5.30, 6.30, and write for about three, four hours. And like you, it's really hard on the brain. You're constantly making decisions which way your character should go. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard. So I like to do it when I'm fresh in the morning. And for my technique of writing, I usually start with a time period that I like. And I say, what is the problem that I can have in that time period? Well, for World War II, spies coming in on the East Coast was the problem. Then what kind of characters do I need in order to find these spies? And I, I build from there. I build my characters up, and the story eventually comes out of that particular mixture. And oh, and my critique partners are in on it from the very first word. And in the early days, I cry a lot. Oh. oh no! <laughs> oh, I drink heavily. <laughs> <laughs> I 
kind of gal? At um, six in the morning? <laughs> I sleep at six in the morning. Um, well, okay, so, um, you know, I usually, I've had day jobs on and off, and certainly when I started, I was working full time, and I decided when I needed to take writing more seriously, it wasn't that I hadn't done a lot of writing, I had, but I was like, you know, there's a book uh, called The War of Art um, that's by Stephen Pressman, and it's a very useful little book. It's a little repetitive, but it has some really good principles in it for me, and it's the treating it like a job. And Are you talking about the art of war? The art, no, the war of art. The war of uh, oh, okay. war of art. It's twi okay. it's, it's Stephen Pressman. Yeah. yeah, it goes it goes like that. Oh, but but I, think uh, I have it. I didn't it's, realize it's, that it's, was the name of it. It's <laughs> worth reading. Yeah, and um, you know the idea that you, you know if you have a job you show up and that's the number one principle, <laughs> and so even though I drink heavily, um, <laughs> I would set a schedule of the heavy drinking and the writing. And, uh, and, and uh, like, so I was, I, when I started, I did it from like 10 to midnight. And my goal was to write two pages. And I had all of these kinds of rules that I made for myself, but that was the main thing. Show up every night, do the work, you do, and then the next day, you, you know, you do it again. And, and that's really kind of carried, carried over. Um, I, I now find that I actually write better during the day than I used to. Um, it, 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 and which is sad because I was so used to the mm -hmm. night writing, which is great because it's quiet and you know. But I, I'm a little I'm a little sharper during the day, but but not early. And you know, I, I have a lot of distractions. I don't try to get a ton of words done. You know, if I if I get over 500 words, that's fantastic. I I rarely hit a thousand words in a day. Um, but you know, I I don't. I've gotten to the point with my writing where my drafts are pretty much, that's the draft that came out is the draft that's in the book. I write slowly. And I, I'm also learning that I need to give myself time off, which was a lesson um, that actually, you know, a, a week just, like I've been traveling doing promo um, for this book. That's also really healthy for the creative process for the book that I'm working on now. Just, you know, it's like you write, you write, you write, you write, you write. And it's like, okay, I got to, I've got, you know, 155, you know, I've got a good over a third of a, of a draft and now I really need to stop and think about what the rest of the book is going to look like. So it's both being disciplined, trying to be consistently productive, but also to realize that things take time and don't rush the important things. Hmm. Yep. Uh, I, um, I'm somewhere in the middle of all of this, uh, although I'm a heavy drinker. Okay, I'm saying it. <laughs> Um, I tend to start at the uh, uh, coffee, and my husband so wonderfully makes me coffee. Oh, God, that's so great. Anyway, <laughs> and then at 8 o'clock, I usually start writing, and I'm there until 11 or 12. I think the magic four hours or something like that. But then I often go back, and sometimes I have inspiration very late at night. Uh, it's amazing what a martini will just let you write. Um, so for me, it's a lot of fun. I also, here's one thing that I do. We do a lot of cruises. My husband loves to cruise. I'm attached to this guy. Can you tell that? But anyway, okay. <laughs> and I call them writer's retreats mm. because otherwise I would go stark raving mad. I mean, you're on a ship. For me, who cares? I mean, <laughs> huh. Um, it's water, you know, water, water everywhere. So I get to have uninterrupted and on cruises, I tend to write six to eight hours a day. I really am totally productive. And I changed in this book right here, I changed villains over the Bermuda Triangle. <laughs> I'm sure that had something to do with it. I Heather, am. my first book was written on a boat. Really? Uh, yes. There you go. It's very peaceful, isn't it? And and they can't get you. And then you put it down. Then you put it down. You've done like it. And you say, oh, my God, I'm done. Okay. And then someone makes you dinner. Someone, you know, someone someone gives you a drink. You no, I had to make the someone. dinner. <laughs> oh. They make your bed. They make your bed. I mean, cruises are great for writing. Oh, I was going to add one other tip, which for me is really important, and that's getting exercise. Um, I'm very, very uh, vigilant about that. Taking walks mm. is really, really helpful for the. I get up and process. do 45 minutes of exercise every single yeah. morning. Yeah, oh, okay. yeah, and you know whatever it is you need to do, but it's it's such a sedentary activity that that's yeah, the, the thing I always recommend to everybody: have an exercise program. It's really important. Yeah. 
You'll think better, too. Okay, well, I think we have just about a, just a little time to answer some questions. If anybody has any questions out there, go for it. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess I'm thinking both question. Uh, could you please explain why or how place becomes a character for you? What what is it about a place that draws your imagination? And for you, what social values? Well, place is also a, a value for me. I mean, it's really important to me. This is set in Texas. I know this this made up place. I can, I, you know, Lisa, you said that you feel like you just immediately start being there and seeing what things are. As soon as I start, I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm there. Well, a couple things. Um, when I decided to write seriously to write a book for publication, I asked myself what I could write about that I, what I could talk about that was somewhat unique. And at the time, you didn't have very many Westerners, American writers, writing books that were set in contemporary China. They were writing books that were set in period China, not contemporary. I traveled to China a lot. I'm thinking this is really interesting. This was something I would like to be able to share with people. Mainly, I think that you know characters exist in the physical world in a particular environment, and it controls a lot of how they interact. It's, it's, it, it's what they're bouncing off of. So I try to look at place in, in both of these ways. Um, when it comes to China, for example, you, you don't want to exoticize a place um, that to a million, a billion and a half Chinese is the place they wake up in every morning. Um, but I also write stuff set, say, in Southern California, which was where I was born and raised, which to me was very normal until I got out in the rest of the world and heard people how they reacted to that. <laughs> so you want to try to find the ordinary and the exotic and the exotic and the ordinary. Well, for me, with the social issues, um, I am very interested in how people, how people keep, why they keep secrets and how it it informs their lives, what they do. So that's always sort of at the bottom of it. The other thing I'm interested in, I'm not interested in ser serial killers or people who, I'm interested in what causes a person who is a perfectly normal, everyday person to suddenly feel as if their life is spun out of control and the best way they can deal with it is to get rid of someone. And I actually had an experience where I... Um, said this to a crowd and a woman came up afterwards and said she had never heard anyone say that before and that her daughter had been killed by a man that had that happened to he walked into a 7-eleven and someone recognized him and he killed everyone there mm. <gasps> because he said he, ju he, he just couldn't stand the idea that someone would know that he had done this so he did something much worse um, in my second book I was it was about veterans of the war of, of um, the Gulf War about how veterans are treated in this country. It just drove me crazy. And then the next one was about um, the banking industry and the fact that um, the town had gone bankrupt and what people had, you know, how people had to deal with it. The fact that suddenly there was not a library in the library in volunteer time. And it's a small town. Um, so e each of them has had an issue. In the very last one, the issue was having someone who was mentally ill as a young woman and was sent away and her parent her they just left her there for 20 years it turns out i actually know someone that that happened to who found out that she had a twin sister that she did not know about until she was in her 50s i think and she went and she went and found the sister it's a it's a thrilling story found the sister her sister was profoundly retarded and blind and deaf and, not blind, I'm sorry, and deaf, and she just died as one of the world's m the most, most important artists in the United States. Her sister took her into an art program in San Francisco, and this woman's art is everywhere. It, there's just been a book published about it. It's just thrilling. Wow. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to get off on that, it's but our, I just think it's such a wonderful It's our story. passion. You know, we it talk is. about our passions, Yes. and that's, that's yeah, what, what exactly. makes us, that's what makes us right, yeah. the passion of it all, really. Other other questions. Yes. Well, a lot of questions and actually observations floating through my mind. 
Go for it. <laughs> Oh, that's a constant problem. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everybody, I, I think, I mean, the short answer is that, that a mystery is something that, the, um, that the, the reader doesn't know any more than the person who's, in, who's investigating. Uh, in a thriller, you often know who the bad guy is, and the question is, how is it gonna, how is it gonna play out in the end? You know, how's yeah. And suspense is, are you gonna get to that ticking bomb in time? There's actually yeah. three: yeah, mystery, thriller, suspense. And a lot of times, they're combined. And psychological suspense. Ooh, <laughs> yeah, ooh. <laughs> Interesting. Or, yeah. And what comes after it is sort of almost secondary. It's like they've become so known and popular, hmm. all of a sudden things start fading away. Hmm. So Interesting. Being, well, so it's sort of the opposite of what we were talking about, feeling like I, they I got think bad. what happens a lot of the time, and I know we've got to get going and let the... Let let you guys, yeah. <laughs> but uh, what happens just in the in the real world is, you know, the writer. You have all the time you need for your first book. Then you get a contract, and you mm -hmm. have to come up with the second book on contract. So I think a lot of the times that's why the second book is going to seem rushed because it is. It hasn't had all those years to develop. I don't think that's true for me in the way my career path has gone. But that is really really common in publishing. Also, what you find is sometimes the person a person has a, a mystery tucked away in the drawer somewhere and they say bring out anything else you have so the second one maybe is not as good because it's older and not written as well hmm. and thank you so much <laughs> <laughs> it's a great audience <laughs>